Joy has dawned upon the world, promise from creation, God's salvation now unfurled, hope for every nation. Not the fanfares from above, not the scenes of glory, but a humble gift of love, Jesus born of me. seated. Hear this call to confession found on page three of your worship folder. The light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Let us confess our sin to God. Please join me in this prayer confession. God of glory, you sent Jesus among us as the light of the world to reveal your love for all people. We confess that our sin and pride hide the brightness of your light. We turn away from the poor. We ignore cries for justice. We do not strive for peace. In your mercy, cleanse us of our sin. Renew us by your spirit that we may show forth your glory, shining in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's take a few moments to silently confess our sins. Amen. 
please stand to receive these words of pardon. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. To all who have received him, to those who believe in his name, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> he gave the right to become children of God. <coughs> Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, oh, silent flocks by night. time when the children are dismissed to go to their classes and for those of us who are remaining behind this is a time to greet your neighbor wish them happy new year and pass the peace Please be seated. <clears throat> I don't really have too many announcements today, so all I'll do is just direct you to the last page in the worship folder, and you'll see a few little things. And I will say there are um, new daily prayer project guides, so feel free to pick one up on your way out. Good morning, Liberty Church Mainline. I am Matt. I'm the pastor here, and I want to extend a welcome to you and wish you a happy new year, as we've already done. Uh, as we continue in our worship this morning, we're actually going to uh, look at a passage which is especially appropriate for the season of Christmas tide, and we have Epiphany Sunday coming up. Uh, so I invite you to follow along as I read from 
uh, the book of Acts chapter 8. It's printed there in your bulletin, or you can follow along in your copy of God's word. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray for understanding of this passage. Our Lord and our God, we thank and praise you for this record of a conversation about Jesus that resulted in joy. And we pray that now as we reflect on it, that you also would bring Jesus before us and give us the ability, like the Ethiopian, to hear this message and to receive it with joy. And I pray that you give words from you through your Holy Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you ever wish someone would just stop talking? As I ask that question, you might be smirking because you're thinking, yeah, I have somebody particular in mind. Or maybe you have a group of people that you'd love who, to just stop saying everything they're thinking. Well, hold that thought, and I hope that you're not thinking about me, but uh, I understand. You know, sometimes that's how we feel on a Sunday morning. In our passage this morning, we have one person who is a Christian talk about Jesus with another person who's not yet a Christian, and by the end of their conversation, the person who previously had never heard of Jesus is baptized as one of his followers and is filled with joy. For some of us, we might be thinking of the line by Vizzini from The Princess Bride, inconceivable. Because the reality that is most familiar to many of us is that we neither experience nor expect joyful outcomes from conversations with people who don't already share our beliefs. And that cuts always, I think. In fact, I was at a uh, New Year's Eve party last night where there were a couple times in the conversation where uh, a potentially controversial topic came up and said, we're not going to talk about that, redirect the conversation. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you might be thinking, when I hear Christians talk, it doesn't produce joy at all. And maybe that's what's kept you outside of the faith, or maybe that's what's pushed you out of a personal faith that you previously held, or out of a faith community that you were previously part of. Even if you are a follower of Jesus, as you listen to the loudest voices that are broadcast most widely through the multimedia public town square, Maybe you also cringe. Perhaps you're deeply embarrassed by what the most publicized 
Christian so-called influencers say. And on any given day, you can probably see someone rage posting on social media or walk through an intersection in Philadelphia where someone is preaching, air quotes, about Jesus in a way that many of us would consider aggressive, unkind, and deeply unrepresentative of him. Far too often, even the talk of other Christians steals or quells our joy. So in such a time and place as ours, do we really need more words, more speaking about Jesus or God or faith or the Bible? Or would followers of Jesus just be better served to observe a vow of silence and quietly do the right thing and hope that God extends his kingdom, perhaps through telepathy? In 1927, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis articulated his now famous counter-speech argument. And he wrote, if there be time to expose through discussion falsehood and fallacies, to avert evil, by the processes of education. The remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. The translation of that is the best way to fight bad speech is with more speech, with better speech. This year, uh, our sister churches across the Liberty Communion around Philadelphia and beyond are reviewing our mission as a communion, as, as local churches to live speak and serve as the very presence of Jesus for our local neighborhoods. And our mission includes speaking as the very presence of Jesus here on and around the main line. The best speech is that which tells of Jesus and brings joy. And so during this Christmas tide, the Christmas season and epiphany, it reminds us each year that we should be ready to say, like the angel to the shepherds, I bring you good news of great joy that is for all peoples. I suspect uh, that uh, we have seen many packages delivered the past few weeks. So this morning, we're going to look at how God, in a sense, packages and delivers this message of joy. Where joy is sent, what's in it, and who receives it. So where first does God send joy? Not always where we would expect it. So Philip receives a number of surprising instructions, and they're surprising not just because they're supernatural. First, God tells him, leave Samaria. That's a place where crowds of people are believing in Jesus through Philip's teaching. Philip has just planted not only a church, but started an, a movement across an entire region and people group. But God tells him, stop that. I'm sending you someplace else. And the place he sends him is the Jerusalem-Gaza Road. Now, he starts in Samaria. That's about 30 miles north of Jerusalem. And Gaza is about 93 miles uh, from Samaria. So he sends them someplace on this stretch of road, which involves a 30 to 93 mile trip, probably on foot, for a meeting that's literally on the side of a highway in a desert or deserted place. Why would God send a proven and successful evangelist to the middle of nowhere? Because he knew that that's exactly where this man would be when he will be there, and at what time he'd be reading this particular passage of Isaiah so that Philip could start a conversation with him about it. This is like a divine cal calculus problem. If Philip is traveling at speed X from starting point A and an Ethiopian chariot is traveling at speed a Y from starting point B, at what point will M will the Ethiopian meet Philip? If you're a humanities person, I'm sorry if you're twitching right now. That's all the math for today. Remember, he was just in Jerusalem, a much closer, more convenient meeting place. Why didn't God just send Philip there? But in God's wisdom, this was the moment when he would be ready to hear about Jesus. Where do we speak joy? Wherever God is already moving us and sending us for opportunities that we might not even know that he's orchestrating. 
from God's perspective, there are no meaningless movements because he is divinely orchestrating all things. And it's not a creepy, manipulative uh, puppet show, but it's a beautiful and interwoven tapestry or story of which, of which each of us is a part. And this matters both in the wide-angle lens, the big picture of our current culture, and in the ultra-high-density details of our lives. Wide-angle perspective. Speaking about Jesus is really unpopular. Newsflash, that's almost always been the case. In fact, Philip started off in the church in Jerusalem, and he can't be there because of persecution that scattered that church. Our present culture, we feel the pressure of it being deeply post-Christian and secular. And people around us, some people that we know, will argue that Christian ideas are not only wrong or outdated or silly, but they're actually harmful or dangerous. But here's the thing. If God's in charge of all of history, he's also in charge of all the specific obstacles and challenges and pressures that we feel in any given moment. And God may be using them so that we can have just the right conversations about just the right topics with just the right people at just the right time. God orchestrates this encounter in extraordinary ways, but he's also in charge of every detail of everyday life. So there are people in our lives, there are people in your life who are here alongside you on the main line maybe in Wayne or Radnor or Berwyn or Paoli or Wynwood or Ardmore or Havertown or Conchahawken or Newtown Square, webs of relationship with close friends or strangers. And right now, God might be orchestrating opportunities for us to ask someone, would you like to talk about that more? If God's the one in charge of giving us these opportunities, however little confidence you might have in yourself, he actually thinks you're qualified because he's put you in those particular moments and those particular places, and he knows that he's prepared you the way that he has done. It's kind of like uh, attending someone else's New Year's Eve party, which is wonderful. If you host it, thank you so much. But if you're attending somebody else's party, like they've done all the heavy lifting, and you just get to show up and enjoy some good food and some good drink and talk with people that you meet there, like Philip does here. But this is here. This is where we get a little bit nervous. What am I supposed to say? Look at what Philip does. The Spirit's final prompt is for him to jog up alongside the chariot as it trundles along. Not sure he was a runner, uh, but he was able to do this. And he hears the Ethiopian reading Isaiah. And this actually would have been very normal at the time. Ancient people had much less opportunity to read and access to books, and so reading was usually done out loud. So before Philip says anything, he listens first. Then once he hears what's being read, he sees his opportunity, and then he doesn't need any more prompting. He's able to do this part himself. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip is really just doing what Jesus did first. What's striking about Jesus' life is how much emphasis he put on speaking and teaching. He could do miracles anytime, but he mostly wanted to talk to people, often at dinner parties, by the way. The Gospel of Mark records very little of Jesus' teaching, and uh, yet Mark tells us that when demands for healing started to crowd out Jesus' schedule, he would relocate specifically in order to focus again on speaking with people. There's one story where four men carry their paralyzed friend into the presence of Jesus, and the first thing he says is not, rise, take up your mat, and walk, which he gets to, but first, son, your sins are forgiven. Luke tells us that Jesus summarized the whole Bible as the story of his death and his resurrection so that repentance and forgiveness of his sins in his name should be proclaimed to all nations. And the Gospel of Matthew ends with Jesus' instructions to make disciples, student followers of Jesus, by teaching them and baptizing them. Exactly what Philip does here. 
Now, there are some extraordinary elements, but what Philip does is so simple. He listens first so that he knows what's on this man's mind and then starts there where he already is. For goodness sake, the guy's already reading the Bible. How straightforward is that? And if someone is able or willing to read the Bible together with us, that's a great opportunity. In fact, most people are more open to having conversations about faith and religion now than they have been in past years. But God doesn't just use Bibles to convert people. If that were the case, we could just be a publishing house. And I like books, so I'd probably be good with that. But that's not how God works. He uses the book, he uses the word, but he also uses people and conversations. So what are our qualifications? If you're a person and can communicate, God can use you to talk to somebody else about Jesus. And then finally, these are just everyday situations when you think about them. Strip out all of the surprising aspects of it. Ultimately, this conversation happens in a chariot on a journey. Good news, we don't need a chariot. Our forms of transportation, I think, are vastly more comfortable. But a car ride together with someone could be an opportunity to have a really great conversation about Jesus. And the fact that this is Philip uh, having the conversation is really quite fascinating. Because he's somebody who is qualified for office in the church. In a church of thousands in Jerusalem, he was one of seven who was chosen to help the 12 apostles. But his personal ministry is most influential, actually, when he loses his leadership position because he has to leave his church because of persecution. And then eventually ends up preaching to multitudes in Samaria and then to this single high-profile individual. Too often, I think we think you need to have a ministry job or ministry credentials to be able to do ministry, to serve or speak about Jesus. But there are aspects of ministry that are equally well done and sometimes better done by Christians without a recognized position. Right? When a pastor talks about Jesus, no one is surprised. Right? That's my job. You expect the peanut butter salesman to tell you peanut butter is a good idea. Right? But when an ordinary Christian talks about Jesus, many people find it much more convincing and attractive. And Philip is a great example of that in his own life and in this story. He's qualified to be a leader, but he doesn't just tell people about Jesus when it's his job. He tells people about Jesus whenever he gets the chance. And he's sensitive to and responsive to opportunities that God provides him to do so. And that makes him a speaker of joy to others. Now, who receives the message of joy found in Jesus? Interestingly, we don't get his name, but other than that, we learn a lot about him. He's an Ethiopian, and uh, at the time, the kingdom, the ancient kingdom of Ethiopia included uh, all of modern-day Ethiopia, modern-day Sudan, and much of the region around it. It was a vast kingdom at times. And in Palestine, uh, Ethiopian was kind of a blanket term for a black African in Palestine, as this man likely was. So he's also very influential. He serves the Candace, or the Kandake, of Ethiopia. Because the Ethiopian Candace was not a name, but the office of queen mother who oversaw the actual day-to-day -day affairs of her son's kingdom. He's the treasury, treasury secretary of Ethiopia. So he's wealthy. He's trusted because he's allowed to take this journey. And he's able to afford a trip to Jerusalem, purchase a costly souvenir, a hand-copied book of Isaiah. And then he's also highly educated and open-minded because he's willing to learn from and have a conversation with Philip, who's a religious refugee traveling on foot. At the same time, not everything's wonderful for him. As a eunuch, he would have been castrated probably before puberty. Eunuchs were often employed as royal servants because they were considered less dangerous or risky attendants to serve the queen or the queen mother or to supervise the king's harem. Without offspring, they wouldn't be uh, angling to advance their own family's political fortunes. And without those family ties, they were also conveniently expendable, easier to replace or execute without wider political repercussions. Many 
eunuchs enjoyed political influence because they had physical proximity to rulers, but they were, uh, and they were useful, reliable, but not always respected. So they were considered to lack the virility expected of a real man. Now, he had just traveled to Jerusalem, and while there, he would have experienced yet another form of exclusion. He's traveled at least 700 miles, and probably more, but then he would have been stopped at the outer courts of the temple and told, thus far you can come, but no further. As a non-Jew, he could have come no closer than the court of the Gentiles, and as a eunuch, he would never have been allowed to even convert to Judaism. So unable to participate in temple worship, excluded from membership among God's people, he nevertheless pursues God through the study of his word. And Isaiah, if you've read it recently, is a really long book. So if he started from the beginning, he's been reading for quite a while to end up in chapter 53 out of 66 books. But the question he asks is fascinating. Because right before the quoted passage, Isaiah describes the rejection and suffering of a man of sorrows. But that God would use his affliction to make him a substitute who brings peace and an end to the hostility between humanity and God. But the Ethiopian doesn't ask the question of how, he asks the question, who? Who is Isaiah talking about? Who is this person who will do this? And so Philip says to the Ethiopian, let me tell you about Jesus. Now they have a conversation. We don't actually get much of the details of the conversation itself, but at the end, verse 36, the Ethiopian asks one last big question. What prevents me from being baptized? How many times do you think he's asked that kind of a question? What prevents me from having a family? I'm a eunuch. What prevents me from being accepted and respected by my peers? I'm a eunuch. What prevents me from entering the temple? Up to this point, there's always been some bar that he can't clear because of an identity that was not actually his choice and that was enforced upon him by others. Why was that? Now, was God just too picky in the Old Testament and Jesus learned to loosen up? No, the Old Testament law was actually a teaching aid and it spoke about physical defects in a way to speak about the spiritual defects we all have. Eunuchs were physically impotent and unable to reproduce. And spiritually, God tells us we are all spiritual eunuchs. We are unable to bring forth spiritual good, spiritual life. We are impotent before God to do good. And that's why we all need an answer to the question of who. Who can do for me before God what I cannot? Who can fix what's broken in our world and in my life? Who can cleanse what we or I have stained and soiled? Who can do in me what I cannot? Who can work through me for good to others as I cannot on my own? Who can help me speak with joy about him when I can't do it in my own strength and confidence? And here, finally, in the good news of Jesus, he hears there's no bar that he can't or doesn't clear. There's no requirement that he fails. There's nothing to prevent him or us from being fully welcomed and accepted by God because of Jesus. He satisfied every requirement. He has absorbed every shortcoming. So what prevents him what prevents you or I from being baptized, from being identified with Jesus in his death and his resurrection, from enjoying adoption to the family, very family of God? Nothing. Nothing prevents you. Are you tired of being told that you're not good enough, that you don't belong, or 
Are you tired of the voice that has pushed you throughout your life that tells you there's more you should do or that you've fallen short? The best way to fight bad speech is with more speech and better speech. And that's why we exist and seek to speak as the very presence of Jesus here on and around the main line. We get to say what Jesus says. Repent. Believe the good news. Your sins are forgiven. God has done and is doing what we're impotent to do ourselves. And nothing prevents you from being joined to Jesus in faith and baptism so that what God said to Jesus at his baptism might be his word to you now. You are my beloved child, my beloved son, my beloved daughter. And with you, I am well pleased. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Amen. Our Lord and our God, we thank and praise you for the privilege it is to hear the, noise, the message of joy in Jesus. Father, I, I pray that you'd help us to rest in it, bask in who Jesus is for us. And we thank you that in him we have full access to you and in the future can look forward to enjoying your presence endlessly in eternity. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we continue our worship, we're going to join together with the church around the world and throughout the ages in confessing together our faith. As we do this, we focus on who God has told us he is and what God has done for us in history. So I invite you to stand and join together with me. Let us say what we believe. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. At this point, as we come to the Lord's table, which is a physical and tangible sign to us that we are welcomed into the presence of God and that he has given us not only access to him, but himself in his son, uh, we join together in celebrating this welcome in the great Thanksgiving. I invite you to join along in the portions that are printed in bold as I and the band lead us in the portions in plain font.
with joy we praise you, gracious God, for you have created heaven and earth, made us in your image, and kept covenant with us even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who came among us as the word made flesh to show us your glory, full of grace and truth. Therefore, we join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name, saying, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Born in humility, he came to rule over all. Helpless as an infant, he showed the power of your love. Poor in the things of this world, he brought the wealth of your grace. Rejected by many, he welcomed all who sought him. In his dying and rising, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and wine and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the death, the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. So together, we proclaim the mystery of the faith. so that this bread and cup may be for us the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we and all your saints be united with Christ and remain faithful in hope and love. Gather your whole church, O Lord, into the glory of your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Praise to the Father. Praise to the Son, praise to the Spirit, our God, the Three in One. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat of it, all of you, in memory of me. In the same way, after the meal, he took a cup and said, This cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink of it, all of you. For as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the death of the Lord Jesus until he comes again for us, his people. Our Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, Therefore let us keep, keep the feast. A few points of instruction for how we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Uh, first, this is a table for all of God's people. So if you're a follower of Jesus, whether a member of this church or another, you're welcome to participate as we show our oneness in the meal that we share together. Uh, if you're not yet somebody who follows, with Je follows Jesus, we don't want you to feel uh, forced or pressured to participate in uh, this part of the service, which may not reflect where you are spiritually. So we're glad that you're here, and if, uh, you may either choose to remain seated, and you can follow along the prayers that are available in the worship folder. Uh, or as you come forward, you can simply cross your arms and be happy to pronounce a blessing or prayer for you. Uh, we will file through the middle aisle in just a moment. You can take a piece of bread, tear it off, and dip it into the taller glass, which is wine, or the shorter glass, which is grape juice. 
uh, and there are individually packaged uh, gluten-free elements as well, uh, if, and you can just ask for those when you come forward. Those are all the instructions. So with that, the gifts of God for the people of God. time we join together as a people and present our prayers before God, I will lead us in some prayers and invite you to join in, affirm in them. I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and we'll say together, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, as the calendar flips, we do give you thanks for all that you have provided in the year that is past, and we pray that you would guide us and lead us and direct us, and that we would be able to rest in you in the year that is to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also pray in the season where so many are sick and ill. We pray that you would bring rapid healing, and we pray especially for uh, uh, parents and also those who are responsible for either younger or older dependents, that you would heal them quickly so they can serve their family and those that depend on them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray also as we come through this holiday season and we've had uh, many reminders of the relationships that we have in our lives, some of those relationships are quite strained and broken and we pray that you would either give healing or give endurance when those that we love or those that we're attached to, we struggle to love well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we also ask, as the Apostle Paul himself asked, that we might 
together with all of your churches around the world and our sister churches in our community. Grant us boldness to speak with respect and gentleness to those around us of Jesus so that we might share the joy and the good news that you have spoken to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us pray as our Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as we join together in our final song. Hear the joyful sound of our offering As your saints bow down, as your people sing We will rise with you, lifted on your wing And the world will see that our God saves
And now as we go, receive this benediction, this good word that God speaks to you and over you. Now may the true light shine on you. May the sun sent by God be your guide and strength. May you go in peace and live in hope in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.